let me just start by saying that it has been such a pleasure to be part of this project. It's been absolutely wonderful to have a chance to get to know some people who have made extraordinary contributions to Western Australia. And even if they hadn't made the contributions to us, they would be extraordinary people no matter what. And a chance to hold those stories dear, that we have some of those stories on record. And that particularly is important. Let me just acknowledge my beautiful guests. <laughs> Sorry, Jana and Karina. Because uh, tragically, two of those women have passed away since we began this series. Julie Michaels uh, passed away from cancer and Ruth Tarvides, as we know fairly recently, also tragically ended her own life. With those beautiful women who gave so much of their heart and soul and their talents to us and to Western Australia, and also with the thoughts of those Dutch and Australians, in fact, all of the people who have died, who have been murdered on the MH17 flight that was shot down. Nonya and I thought it would be appropriate that we should begin today with a minute's silence as we hold all of those people in our hearts. We send their families loving thoughts and just honour them for one minute. So if I could ask you to enter that with me at the moment. I thank you for your collective prayers and thoughts for all of those gone. So now we turn very much to, well, in fact, even with that in mind, the last time I saw uh, Karina Huang was, in fact, on, at the launch of uh, National Refugee Week. And, uh, and I mentioned then that when you grow up in Australia, your mother thinks, what would I like for my child? Oh, I'd like her to marry somebody good. I'd like her to be happy. I'd like her to have a good job. When you are the mother of a refugee, you think, I want my child to survive. And it does come down to that, that extraordinarily fine line between life and death. Karina, let's start with you. How aware were you growing up as a, a, a child, because you didn't leave till you were 16 or escape till you were 16, of the war escalating around you? Yeah. When I was born, the war was already happening. So it's part of life to me. I didn't know the difference. Huh. We, we used to go to bed hearing the sirens, and I would be screaming out a bomb, bomb, and grab my sisters and brothers and run into the shelter in the house. And it's normal. Um, I consider myself had a beautiful and happy childhood, even though there's war around us. Dad was never home because he was a military man. Um, but life changed when the war was ended. And that's a very uh, tragic and ironic about Vietnam War to me. Tell us a little bit more about that. Um, well, the war went on for more than 30 years, but people didn't leave Vietnam. But when the communists took over, and started to persecute people, and that's when the war ended up with more than one million Vietnamese both people worldwide. And among the more than 300,000 estimated perished at sea. How and many? I, more than 300. Because the UNHCR estimated that one out of three escaped from Vietnam perished. And there were one, about one million Vietnamese both people survived. So that's the statistics that we had, and um, I never thought that I would be part of that statistics growing up. Mm. It's almost incomprehensible to people in Australia that 300,000 people could have perished at sea on the way. Just uh, tell us where in Vietnam you're from. From Saigon. From Saigon. Yes. Okay, so right in the epicentre yes. uh, at the time. How was the decision made for you to escape? Um, around us, thousands and thousands of people had left the country and friends and family members as well, but my mom did not want us to go because we all were just children of hers and my father was in political prison already. Um, she just hung on to her own children. But when Vietnam had war in Cambodia in 1978 and uh, young people as young as 16 would be drafted and sent to fight, and um, then one of our friends actually died, and that's when my mom realized that it's only a matter of time when her children will be drafted to go to war. Even though my father was already in political prison, 
for years and we had no idea if and when he would be released. Our house was confiscated already. We became homeless overnight and we were not allowed to go to school. My mom cannot get a job. But because all of that, it's not enough for her to send her children away in such you know, a, a vulnerable way as put your kid on a wooden boat. But finally, she let us go. So that's the decision was made by my mom. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you were the oldest child, is that right? Um, I was the second oldest. But when I escaped, I escaped with two little siblings, and they yes. were 12 and 10. Now, they didn't know, did they, that you were going to escape? No, no. My mom told me because she trusts that I'm mature enough to keep it a secret. But if the young ones let out and told their friends that, oh, I'm going to leave the country, then we all will be in jail. It's very dangerous. And from Vietnam, even though you're looking at more than a million people trying to leave the country, but it was all done clandestinely. Mm. It's a secret. If the government know you try to escape, organize, or attempt, um, it's prison terms up to five years. Even as little kids. Different situation completely for you, Jana, in the sense that I, I don't think you were as aware of the war, were you, while you were growing up? No, no, not at all. We, I didn't grow up in war. Uh, and uh, in fact, I've grown up in a family. I was born in 57. And Czechoslovakia uh, was a communist country uh, from 1948 till 1989. And so I was born right into it. And both of my parents were members of Communist Party. Uh, they both worked for the army, uh, for the government. And so they, especially my father, they strongly believe in communism. Mm. So there was no chance for me to actually know anything wrong about communism till I became a teenager and started investigating Mm. investigating around and trying to read something and find out for myself. Uh, and real change, just to make a little bit of a uh, background story, mom, mom worked for a secret army as a clerk. Um, I, of course, didn't know she works there because it was secret army until she passed away and it was well after the communism collapse. And that was doctor of philosophy, and he was uh, very steadily climbing the ladder in army, and he was a, a colonel, and the year when I escaped, he was just about to become a general. And of course, I spoiled all of that for them. And the first kind of... Uh, by leaving. Yeah, by leaving, yeah, yeah by escaping. And, and first uh, unsettledness in myself, I, I really discovered when I was about 11, and it was 1968, when Soviet Union armies uh, occupied Czechoslovakia. Uh, and that was as close to the war that I ever got, thanks God. Mm. Uh, we had about over 30 tanks in front of our house. It was kind of a parking lot, lot for tanks, and I had to go to school through them. And uh, I really... Uh, 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 discovered that there is something not quite right because all my friends and their families uh, stopped talking to me because we were, my parents were in army and were supporting communism. Uh, they suddenly, and there was this occupation happening, uh, they kind of saw us as uh, collabor collaborators. And they actually put that on your house yeah, at one yeah, stage? Yeah, we had it on our letterbox. And that was why I started asking questions. I wanted to know what's going on. Why, mm. why my friends at the age of 11, why do they not like me suddenly? And what did your parents say, given that your mother didn't even tell you she was working in oh, no, 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 the secret no. army? No, there were, of course, they protected their positions. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, the Soviet Union uh, um, won this uh, occupation. and. Uh, there was 20 years uh, of uh, more, 20 years more of communism. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, the Communist Party was on the top again and everybody was quiet and everybody was nice to you afterwards anyway because they had to, mm -hmm. they had to protect themselves. But I became quite unhappy about what's going on and, and, and I became a little bit uncertain what's going on and I started asking 
more and more questions, trying to find the truth. And, uh, and it led me into marrying at 19. Uh, my first husband was very much uh, unsatisfied as me. And, and uh, I finished school as a designer, interior designer. And we decided that we would like to live in a country somewhere else where there is not a, a constant lie. Mm. where we can be free, we can read the books we like, we can watch the movies we like, we can choose to listen to the music that we like, we wanted a better life. You know, when you're 23, you, you're bulletproof, you think. Of course, yeah. 10 foot tall and bulletproof, aren't we all? <laughs> you think, oh, there's, we're going we're gonna to find out, we manage and yeah. we, will, we so, will escape. So you'd even hidden it from your parents? Oh, absolutely. If my father would find out that I'm going even to Yugoslavia, he would stop it yeah. immediately. And well, you did go to Yugoslavia, and you did manage to escape through yep. Yugoslavia. Yep. But what were the consequences when you finally got here to your family? Well, it already started in Yugoslavia because we find the underground organization, and my father find out that we actually didn't go where we said we're going to go. That was my first lie in my life, and uh, he uh, threatened, and I knew that he's going to be chasing me that he's going to find out where I am and take me back home, which would definitely mean a prison. Uh, so he had his own agenda. He needed to get me back to survive. Mm. So he could so, get his general... Yeah, that's right. Marriage. So he can become what he wants to, wants to be and uh, protect you know, his own family that was at home. And so uh, he didn't manage. We managed to escape. And he was kicked out of the army, mom as well, and my brother also lost a job. But uh, it's not like uh, Karina's sad story. They actually got another job. It just was outside of a government. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't anymore be in that same position. Yeah, but you weren't exactly but, popular number one yeah, <laughs> in yeah, the family. Yeah, that, that was, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, he never really forgiven me until the communism collapsed. Mm. So he forbidden my family to communicate with me. Mm. And until 89, I haven't had a chance to actually talk to them. So, okay. And I escaped in 81. And, and now? Well, they both passed away. And I've managed to see each of them once. And... Um, Was there forgiveness? Yes. We've never I've never talked about it. And they never talked about it. And in fact, I think uh, because there became uh, the, uh, the regime changed, uh, it actually helped them not to be in the positions that they could have been. If, I, mm -hmm. if Dad become a general, he would be making a decisions that were probably not very popular when the mm. regime changed. Mm. So, I think. just in terms of contact, um, Karina, you you escaped on a tiny little wooden boat. <laughs> really, into the unknown. How did your mother ever know that you were okay? Um, firstly, the boat wasn't that small, but in the context it is because it's packed with 373 people. And uh, my mom had no way of knowing if we make it somewhere until um, the boat owner managed to send a telegram to his family. And then his family went and contact those that had members that travel on the same boat. And that's how my mom knew that we would survive and we got to Indonesia. And that's all she knew. And then she had to wait for months later where um, I actually was able to send a letter to my mom through camps and collect mails to send home to their family members in Vietnam. Mm. And that's when we knew. But. Um, as far as I was listening to Yana's story about wanting freedom, you know, just to travel and what have you, I keep thinking, God, if, I, if my mom didn't send me out of Vietnam and when I grew as to be old enough, I probably would have done what Yana did. Because um, I remember when my sister first escaped, my mom and I were so desperate to find out if she made it or not. And there was no way of communications of any shape or form. So the only hope we had was just to listen to the radio um, VOA, which is Voice of America, or BBC. They often report if both were um, is rescued at sea, or sunk, or was shot, or something happened. And, and think about thousands of boats escape every week. 
how could we know it was my sister's boat, but my mom and I were so desperate, so we were hopeful anyway. Mm. And in order to hear those radio, uh, my little sisters and brothers would have to be got the house to let us know if there's anyone come in, the neighbors can be knocking at the door anytime. Mm. And then my mom and I would be in the bedroom, close the door, get underneath the bed, underneath the blanket with a small radio and the antenna sticking out so that we can pick up the signal. And that's the only way we can get any news from the outside world, we just to listen. Exactly the same. Yeah, oh, just to exactly. listen to In the, the radio. In the middle of the night, we were listening to this radio, yeah. trying to get a bit of a sense of what's truth and what's not truth. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. That's yeah. true, because what's yeah. often reported, yeah. Yeah. well, I mean, you look at a current situation, um, and this is not about my political views, it's about reporting fairly and the fact that we're being told that it's that we're not going to be told <laughs> who's arriving, when they're arriving, how many people, yeah. and who's on there and who's safe and where they're going, mm -hmm. I think is appalling. It is absolutely appalling for all of this reason mm -hmm. that we need to have that information there for yeah. all of us. Yeah. I mean, there's some similarity, but the parallels between Yana's story and mine. Um, her escape had caused her father's a chance to become a colonel. But my escape cost my mom two years in prison. And sadly, that was seven years after I made it to America, became American citizen. Then one day when I was in college, I received news that my mom was in prison. And I was devastated because my father was still in political prison for being a military man. Now my mom is in prison too, and at that time I didn't know why. But my biggest fear was I had two little siblings at home and there was no one to look after them. And later I learned that my mom was punished because of my escape. Mm. Mm. That's a terrible burden to bear. Mm. Karina, can you tell us uh, the, the process of how you got to America? Because that's a long way from the Indonesian islands. Um, first we made it to um, Indonesia and then um, it was a jungle. Three months later, we were found by the Red Cross, and then the UNHCR came over and established refugee camp. But didn't you already have an, uh, an incursion with the Malaysian military? Yes, we, our boat was shot at by Malaysian military, and sadly, they had just introduced the pushback policy um, like we have now. So they pushed all the boats back, and they shoot to kill, just to ensure that no boats come to their shore, and my boat was among the first few that encountered that. So they shot at our boat, they took everything we own, and then they sent us out. Of course, return to Vietnam was not an option, so we continued on and we ended up in Indonesia. But along the way, uh, we ran out of food and water and people started to die, so we had to throw bodies to the ocean, and I witnessed it every day. And eventually, we made it to Indonesia, um, then the government took us to an uninhabited island and left us there. Three months later, those who survived were rescued by the UNHCR and the Red Cross. Then um, eventually they would send representatives from countries like Australia, Canada, America, France to come and interview these um, asylum seekers. And give it, at that time we all were automatically considered refugees. Mm. I've only just learned the term asylum mm. seekers now but we were refugees then, and then countries would accept us. But it takes a long time, it took a long time to process um, for us to leave Indonesia. Then uh, I was given uh, refugee status in America because A, um, we all three were unaccompanied minors, mm -hmm. and B, my father was in the military. Uh, so those are the categories that we were given. And then from there, we were transferred to another refugee camp in Indonesia that was close to the Singapore. And then after our process of medical clear clearance, and then we were sent to Singapore. And then from Singapore to America. So that's the long journey. There are a billion questions in there that I wanted to ask you, but um, one of the things that is now a focus for you is looking at the grave sites for those who are refugees who've lost. We know that in Vietnamese culture especially, it's incredibly important that you honour the graves of, of your ancestors, that you take care of it. You see them all over Vietnam with people taking the most beautiful care of them. But of course you can't do that when people are dying in little far-flung islands. How did that come about? 
Um, I, I uh, was not old enough to understand about the culture uh, and how important it is to have the funeral for your loved ones. The only one I knew um, that died was my grandmother, and she was buried three days before my escape. So in fact, I left the cemetery and went straight to my escape site, so that was the only death that I've experienced. Um, but I know that the funeral and, and uh, visiting grave signs were important, but that's just, that's it. Until I had a loved one who died in the refugee camp and was buried in the jungle in Indonesia. And uh, then I came to America and visited his mom, and uh, I realized that she carried that pain with her. 19 years later, after her son died in the refugee camp, she still could not move on. It's not because she lost her child, but it's because the circumstances. She couldn't bury him, give him a proper burial. She could not go back and revisit the grave. Um, all the guilt that she has, many times she looked at her other sons in America who became successful, and she thought of the one who was left behind in the jungle. So I came back to that jungle and found his grave. And, and then I brought the ashes back to my auntie, and I realized that she was transformed. It's like she found the will to live again. And that was the first time I realized that there were those who lost their loved ones in circumstances like in the refugee camp that could not even bury their loved ones would carry that pain. Um, so then I shared that story with others. Then the next thing I knew, um, I came back and forth to the jungle where I was because I had buried people in that jungle with my own hands and I witnessed people die in that jungle. So I brought families back to find closure. Mm. It's an amazing and wonderful thing. Thank you. you. You mentioned identity there. Jana, I want to come back to you too, because coming to a new country you're, and escaping another country, in this case, so the Czech Republic, or what was to become the Czech Republic, identity, how do you maintain it? How do you keep your cultural links while embracing a new country? Well, Did you arrive with passports, by the way? Yeah, I arrived with passport. Uh, uh, Though uh, when we were trying to escape, we were trying to cross the borders to Austria from Yugoslavia. And uh, we actually managed to cross the borders um, to the Austrian uh, section. And there was a person who was obviously not liking the refugees. And he stamped our passport. And then he crossed it and pushed us back to Yugoslavia. So I had this passport that was actually damaged and stamped, and I, there was a definitely I could not ever change my mind and go back mm. to back home because it would be obvious that I was escaping. But so we pretended that we lost the passport, uh, but then when when we find the, uh, with the with the help of American embassy we find this uh, uh, undercover um, uh, organization who who helped us, I actually, we actually had the passport. Mm. We, we showed them the passport and showed them what happened and everything else. So I did arrive with the passport and uh, to Australia. I should probably say why we ended up in Australia, because mm. uh, uh, we really didn't have uh, too many choices. You know, we only knew uh, some friends in, Aus uh, in uh, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And all we could think about was we would love to be in Switzerland. Uh, but the organization basically told us, no, there are only two countries that you can go to, and that was America and Australia. And the communist propaganda about America was so bad, <laughs> and we knew so, so very little of any other thing than that that I was so afraid to go to America that uh, we decided to go to Australia because we didn't know anything about Australia. <laughs> no, I'm sure. Because no one ever talked about Australia <laughs> in my country. So we said, yeah, we go to Australia. And so we ended up in Australia. And I was so determined to become part of Australian culture that <clears throat> I've promised myself I will not read any Czech books, I will not watch any Czech movies, I will not do anything Czech till I know the English. <laughs> ah, okay. And I was very stubborn about it, though I was, uh, I, I of course reached out to a, a Czechoslovakian society. They did came to pick us up from the airport and they helped us to um, 
organize our banking and everything else. And I mean, it was unbelievable. I think the Red <laughs> then, Cross was also. Helpful. Yes, yeah. We, we arrived to Greylands. They took us to Greylands from the airport and they gave us an accommodation. They gave us food. The Red Cross came with clothes because we only had a little bag of clothes. Mm -hmm. Uh, all our money got stolen in Yugoslavia, so not that we had that many. We only had a little bit of money that we smuggled through the borders, about 1,000 of Deutschmarks, 1,000 of Deutschmarks, and, we, and that got stolen anyway. So we were giving, when we came here, we were giving totally everything, and English lessons, and people were uh, so nice to us. Everybody was making some remarks, you know, hello, how are you, how are you doing in the bus and, you know, everywhere you go. And we thought, oh, these people, they just... <laughs> <laughs> They're weird. <laughs> I remember first yeah. time we came to a King's Park and people were actually lying on the grass, watching little TVs. The kids were running around because in, our, in my country you're not allowed to step on the grass. Oh. <laughs> no, no, no one would walk on the grass in a park. Why? Uh, Isn't that what it's no, for? It's no, just no. no. It's no, to look you at. have to stick to the path. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that such a difference, yeah. you know, such a little thing <laughs> got stuck in my mind. What month did you arrive? Uh, we arrived in uh, November. Oh, so yeah, you're getting was, into the hot. Oh, it was lovely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> first, first thing we have done, went to the beach, We've never seen the ocean or sea before. Mm. So mm. we walked from Greylands to uh, City Beach, and we were hitchhiking. It was about six of us hitchhiking, not, not a word of English. <laughs> and the, the, the guy stopped, first car stopped, got us on, and in a very, one girl had a little bit of English knowledge, and he said, I have 11 children, not a problem with six. <laughs> so, <how> amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's no, extraordinary, it was, isn't it? It was beautiful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What about Karina coming back? Why the decision to come back to Western Australia or to come to Western Australia after? You, because you were established in America. Yes, I was. Um, it's my husband who was Italian born. He came here by boat. His name is outside on this on this plaque. Oh, marvelous! And, 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 and Robert grew up here. And uh, when we first got married, um, he said. So I'll follow you wherever you go. So we went to America to be with my family. And then eventually we decided to move here because Robert's parents were getting older. And um, that was seven years ago. And I'm very glad I made that move. I love it here. I love the people. And I think I will make this my home. <laughs> yes. It's often said that because England, America, and Australia ostensibly speak the same language, that it's a similar culture, but my experience is it's not. Mm. So how did you adapt coming here? How was it different to America? Um, it's, it's not so much difference, I guess, because when I came here, I was no longer treated as a refugee. And, be, and I also sp you know, speak English. So it's, it's an easy transaction, uh, <laughs> transition, mm -hmm. yes. But when I first came to America, it was um, a culture shock, you know, not mm. speaking the language, it was devastated. And I was still young, didn't have my parents, and surviving in that condition um, is very, very tough. Uh, so when you see people who came to our country now as refugee, they had just, you know, passed through one hurdle of the journey and the refugee camp. But when they came here, um, the difficulties start all over again. I used to think survive the jungle was easier than survive in America. And that was because in the refugee camp, um, even if I'm hungry or hurt, I can talk to people and tell them about it. But in America, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And it was devastating. And of course, everything was overwhelming. I used to feel so um, uh, desperate. I didn't think that I could ever speak English and survive. But I did very quickly. And that's all about surviving. Yeah, I, guess I so. remember I learned English through a sewing book. And I chose so, that book? book, Sewing. Oh, Sewing Book. Because it has pictures. Ah, of course. You know, so there's a picture of needles, and underneath it said needles. Yeah. I said, oh, so that's what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> so that helps. That is amazing. Were you offered any language um, help like Yana was? No. OK, so where did you go first in America? Um, we all went to Pennsylvania first, and three days after we arrived, our guardian, who was only 23, 
put us all straight to high school right away. And um, so I had uh, less than two years to finish high school, then I went straight to college. Mm. And uh, there wasn't any ESL programs available at that time for us as English as second language, so I just fit in like the rest of the American um, children and um, got on. And um, just quickly, this is really interesting. I, when I was in Vietnam, I already nearly finished high school, but my math and science were really, really bad. When I came to America, I thought, well, math was bad. What about biology and <laughs> chemistry? Yeah, everything else was worse because of English. <laughs> yes, of course. So all of a sudden, my brain switched. I became top of the class for math and algebra and geometry, you name it. <laughs> it was so good because there were numbers. Mm -hmm. And at least I can deal with it. So mm. it's just talking about survival. That was one of them. That's an amazing. Mm. Flick. What I what also makes me smile though, Karina, is that you said this is really interesting. Like the whole thing hasn't been interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, this is uh, the most extraordinary story for both of you, and yet um, uh, horrendous on some levels, but so extraordinary. I wanted to talk with you a little bit about identity too, because you did. You certainly didn't have a passport when you got to Indonesia that had been taken from you anyway. So how did they process you? How did you find your way in America? Well, firstly, um, after I tried a few times to leave Vietnam by boat and got caught, and my mom decided that she was going to put me on a boat with Chinese because at that time they were exiled from, from Vietnam, so they were more of kind of entitled to leave. Mm -hmm. So I went with a fake birth certificate as okay. a Chinese girl. But as soon as I arrived in Indonesia, um, those papers were gone anyway because the boat was destroyed and we went through pirates' chase and shot by Malaysians. So there's nothing left. Even if I had a passport, I don't think it will, I will be able mm. to keep it. So when we were interviewed by the delegations uh, of America, we told them our names and birth date and where we were born, who our parents were, and they start from there. Right. Yeah. Okay and you not being able to communicate effectively about where you were. We actually, we've got some photographs, and I know some of them have come up while we've been talking. I know the first one is um, at the front of Karina's book, but the second one is her at just uh, mm. 16. That's, that's you at 16. Yes, that was me. Beautiful, beautiful kid. You just, and for all of us here, we're just trying to imagine what you're going through, the horrors and after the war. And this boat here? Um, that picture was a group of Vietnamese boat people were rescued by the uh, American Navy in South China Sea. And I chose that picture just to give you an idea of what it was like for us to escape from Vietnam, being at sea in that open condition uh, for days and tossed about by storm. Look at how vulnerable that was. And any moment, a big storm could take down the whole entire boat. And that was only maybe 50 or 60 people. Our boat had nearly 400. And we sat with knees to our chins for the whole duration. And uh, you look at it. When we were so desperate, they, they used a bed sheet and a pole to raise SOS, you know, a signal to the to Navy. Mm. Yep. How, how, how does it feel? When we see that powerful photograph and the desperation to get out of that awful situation, when you hear people going off boat people or their queue jumpers. I just hope that the public have a little bit more knowledge, be more informed before we make our judgment, because there is no words can describe how vulnerable it is to be in a boat like that when you're in the vast ocean and you looked around you, there was sky and water around you, and you had no idea where and when you will be landed somewhere. And as soon as you arrive somewhere, you feel hopeful and alive and thinking that you are safe, and all of a sudden, um, you were taken somewhere and told that it either we'll keep you in detention center as if you were a criminal of some kind, or go home. Hmm. That will be very devastating. Um, How do you feel about the current offshore processing? Um, I, I hope, I wish that the government would do it otherwise. And, and the least is to, to accept these uh, human beings with humanity. That's the least that we could do for them before we go through processing and see if they are qualified or not. Hmm. Look at that. Hmm. 
mm. and you know how vulnerable it has been for them, and who in the right frame of mind would leave your loved ones behind, leave everything you're familiar with, and jump on a boat and sit like that to cross the ocean to come to a country to, for what, a better life? Um, it's not hard for me to grasp that concept. It's not. <laughs> It shouldn't be hard for anybody. Because being a boat person is not a choice. Being a refugee is not a choice. Like I said, Vietnam War went on for 30-some years. People didn't leave the country because of the war. Mm. But when all these persecutions came, when you can no longer live in your own place, and you had to leave your mom and your dad and know that you might not ever get to see them again, it's hard. Or that you might die in the process. Oh, of course, yes. So many, mm. And I thousand. think the uncertainty of it, uncertainty yes. being somewhere where you really don't know if you're going to end up here or there, it must be absolutely killing. Mm. I, I only spent three and a half months in a refugee camp that was very poorly run. And I know how sick I was, how skinny I came to Australia. And I have to say that if it would taken a year, never mind three years or longer, mm -hmm. I would not have survived. Mm -hmm. And we always talk about the boats and about not about the people. Mm -hmm. I think the people is what it is really, yeah. what we have to be looking at. We didn't have an ocean around, mm -hmm. but if there was an ocean around Czechoslovakia, I'm sure we would be jumping into it and swimming over. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have it, so we took a car or we whatever means we had. Yeah. It's so, wise, it's so wise, yeah. those words. It's not about a boat, it's about the people. And that's what mm -hmm. Karina Inside always it. tried to say. Mm. Jana, uh, you have made in so many ways wonderful contributions to Western Australia, in particular your book, which has the most amazing collection of, uh, of extraordinary women, painted by an extraordinary woman too. But you couldn't have done that, could you, had you stayed in Czechoslovakia? No, no, I couldn't. Uh, uh, to choose, you really ha didn't have your own choices. And that's the bottom line. You couldn't say, I want to be this and I want to do that. There was no uh, private enterprise that was prohibited. So your choices were very limited and you were kind of funneled, funneled yeah. into it, whatever, you know, was. Uh, so I proper, I, I've always painted as a child. I, it was always my hobby. Uh, but it wouldn't have become my profession for sure. Mm. And, and quite frankly, I uh, never imagined that it would become my profession even here because my parents would always say, no, you, you, you can't feed yourself as an artist. So, and I think that goes forever and ever this you know, do some real job. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right, that's right. <laughs> so, you you know. say that about writers, don't they? But what do you really do for a living? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, so what did you do for a while before you were able to explore your art? Well, I always had, art was always my saver, my kept me, you know, um, sane and, and happy. But I have done all sorts of other businesses uh, for the first few years in Australia. Whatever came our way, we were doing it. Mm -hmm. And if, if it meant that we were building a brick wall, I was a, a bricklayer mm. for a while. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we had a cleaning business and we had, uh, I've, I was knitting and sewing for people when we came and all sorts of things. And uh, then we had uh, businesses with food as well. We had takeaway shop and a coffee lounge and this and that. And, uh, but always through all of that, through all the other things that I have done, I always, always kept painting. I attended technical college and done all sorts of uh, courses. I um, worked with different artists in their private studios. My first exhibition was in 89 in Gombok Gallery, as we were talking about it before. Ron Gombok, also a wonderful, wonderful artist, sculptor, that's does right. those beautiful things and has his place up in, uh, just in the early part of yeah. the Swan Valley, just past Midvale. Yeah, that's beautiful. right. It was my first exhibition. And it was a good time, because that was in 89. And in 89, art was, uh, uh, people were more open to buy art. Mm. Mm. And uh, it wasn't probably such a tough time for people as it is now. And I remember with a great 
fondness, that exhibition, because I exhibited 54 paintings and 49 got sold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that will yes. never happen again, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you wanted to tell your parents you can make a living out of it. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, yeah. So it was fantastic. But when you say that I uh, made contribution and that, you know, I really think that my biggest contribution is that uh, that I'm capable of sharing that art noise with my students, mm. that I make some other people, that I bring some passion into their life and something that they can mm. follow up. It makes me really happy. Yeah, and I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure. I think what your contributions, as I say, for both of you are on so many different levels. Lynn Beasley, of course, who we had here in, the, in that chair the last time you mm. were here. The, um, I, I wonder just about that. You both have incredible work ethics. Do you think that is because you were both refugees? Or do you think you would have had that in your own cultures had you been able to stay? Um, I, I think it's a combination of the fact that I was able to, to survive such conditions that it does not, um, that, that I no longer have the fear of the unknown or something new. So when you look at my um, career path, it's very diversified. And um, I, I take life as it's come, and I handle circumstances and situations the best I could as if I have to survive. I don't make long-term plan. And in retrospect, I think it's because nothing was never long-term in my life growing up. The war and my dad was taken away, the house were taken away, and loved ones were taken away, so nothing permanent. Um, and uh, so because of that, uh, I, I, I think that's, that's where I have my, my mentality and work ethics. And I work very, very hard in everything I do. I give it my best, and most of the time I accomplish what I really want to set out to do. Yeah. Do, do you think in general migrants might work harder? I, I think so, because um, if you were given a chance after everything was taken away from you, and it's particularly given the life where you can live, you will make the best of it. Mm. I think that contrast, you can see the contrast much more if you had a hardship. So you can, that contrast between happiness and a hardship is so strong. So I think, yes, even that it sounds a little bit generalized that someone with the, uh, our background would work harder than somebody else. I think people, uh, you know, we can't really generalize, but I think you can, you can thrive, you thrive mm. harder probably because you know how bad it could be. Mm. Mm. <laughs> that's true, that's true. And what about awards too? I mean, uh, Karina, you have been inducted into the WA Women's Hall of Fame in 2011, 2012, you were a nominee for WA Woman of the Year, Person of the Year, which is extraordinary. Plus you're a special representative for the UN Refugee Agencies. Uh, UNHCR. What? I mean, I, I know that you would never have imagined when you were 16 and trying to escape and just trying to live every day when people were dying all around you. But uh, how do you feel about those awards now? Um, I, I, I was very, very surprised and extremely humble when I was inducted to the Hall of Fame with the rest of the other extraordinary uh, women. Uh, I've never imagined I would be were given that recognition, but in a way, um, I'm glad that, that I received that because on a personal level, it's encouraged me to go out and do more and give more. But um, in a larger context, I think the more people's work being recognized encourage others to do more um, because you don't know, you wouldn't know the stories until it's brought out to the public and then you realize that there's so much more that need to be done, mm. and there's so much more one can give. Mm. So I am glad that I was uh, given those recognitions. Mm. Yeah. What does Vietnam mean to you now? This, this is a country when I was born, but because it's still communist, um, it's hard for me to think of that as home. Mm. Have you been back? Yes, I have. Yes, I've been back. The first time I returned to Vietnam was when my father was first released from prison. And I heard that he was very ill, and I thought he might die before I get to see him. So I make that, that risk 
thinking that it was risky, but luckily when I returned to Vietnam, uh, the communists left me alone. Um, so I saw my dad and my mom and siblings for the first time um, after I left. God, how was that? It, it, it was amazing, it was hard. Yeah. Yeah. Could not describe that. Yeah, I, when the airplane started to land and from the window I looked down, I started to see the farms and I see men with a conical hat and the buffalo. Um, and I started to cry so much. Mm. And I figured, oh my God, if I landed there and see my mom and dad, I don't know if I could stand up. Mm. It was, it was, yeah. How did it feel to leave? It, it, um, it's a very mixed emotion. On one hand, I thought, I got to see my mom and my dad again now. Um, why would I leave? But then looking around at that conditions and the countries with the communists, and I thought, at least I can get on the airplane and go to the other side of the world, and, and, uh, and then I can help to bring them out. But if I stay in Vietnam, that would be it. So it, it was very contrast. On one hand, I didn't want to leave because I didn't want to leave my parents. But on the other hand, I looked forward to get on that airplane and go back to a society where there's freedom, where there's a ability for me to make a difference. Are your parents with us now? Yes. Yeah. My father's in California, and uh, he's now uh, sadly suffering dementia. Mm -hmm. And the worst part is that any time he has that, that um, moment, he thinks he's still in prison with, polit with communists. Yeah. So yeah. that was hard. My mom is OK. And we all made it to America. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you think about, how do you reflect on Czechoslovakia now, the Czech Republic? Well, it changed a lot. So in uh, 89, there was a revolution. Uh, I, uh, my mom came. My, my mom immediately when was free to leave, never ever left the country before. So she was the first one who came to visit me. Uh, and uh, it was quite a magic because we didn't, we were not the best of mates when I was a teenager. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> ah, welcome Which to is most normal. of our worlds. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when, she, when she arrived in uh, 89, it was the best two and a half months I had with her, and she died half a year later. Oh. So I was so grateful that I had that two and a half months of absolute happiness yeah. with her and fun, and she was, she was the best. We had, a, we had a, at that time, we had a cleaning business, and uh, she would just, uh, you know, and I had a, quite a good education, and I thought, oh, she's going to think I'm... You know, I'm not good if I am in this country and doing mm. a cleaning. But mm. I was painting during the day and doing cleaning <laughs> at night. It was very convenient for yeah. me. And, but she, she just put a, a, a vacuum cleaner on her back and went with me. <laughs> and it was just so, so amazing. So we had a good time. And uh, Dad never made it here, but I saw him once before he passed away. I, uh, after the revolution, I uh, made my way, way over, I'm very conscious about because my dad was very angry at me when I escaped. He sent me a, a terrible letter, uh, really condemning me and, and comparing me to fascists and mm. whatever, and said that they all will die because of me 10 years earlier and so on, and I was really upset about it. I, I could not shake it off for a long, long, long time. And, so first time when I uh, was making way over there and knowing that I'm going to meet him, uh, I thought, I wonder how that's going to go. But it went beautifully. He never brought it up. Mm -hmm. It was like we've never had any arguments mm -hmm. before. He just welcomed me and, and it was all fine. So I, I just want to know, what did your mother think when she saw how talented you were, when she saw your paintings? <laughs> Well, I, th I think that was a, it wasn't a really big surprise because I've always painted. Mm. So I always had that bit of talent. And uh, so I think it was just a natural progression and everybody probably expected that I will be doing something with it. Mm. Maybe not as good as I am doing it now, but you know, it's, there is always more to do with painting. Mm. You, you're never mm. as good as you would like to be. And what's amazing is that, um, is that Jana does that with a palette knife. Mm. 
She doesn't do it with a paintbrush. Not all of them, no, no. Just that book is done, the portraits. By the way, uh, in, the, in the book is a 50 uh, Western Australian women, and uh, the inspira or we chose a many of these women from the Hall of Fame. Uh, and Karina is part of it, part of the book, as you can see. And uh, these particular portraits are painted with palette knife. But the other paintings, the two that you see from me, my previous uh, collection and upcoming collection, they're done with brush. Mm -hmm. So these are done with palette knife. My personal challenge was to paint them within 24 hours uh, and with palette knife, yeah. Ah, so. <laughs> Self torture. <laughs> <laughs> Good torture. <laughs> I, I wonder what you would say to others who are looking to come to Western Australia. How would you describe it? What advice would you give them? Well, I can't be a better country than Western Australia. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that, that's a kind of a question, you know. Who is uh, allowed to come to Western Australia now? Mm. You know, and I know that whoever will make it will want to have a better life and w will work hard. Mm. It's the truth. And, the truth. and we need to truly uh, treat them with love, care and respect so we can bring out a really good citizens. Mm. Otherwise, it's not going to happen like that. No, that's true, absolutely. For you, Karina? Very much the same as Jana. I'm happy here, and I think Western Australia is wonderful. And anybody who has the chance to come here uh, is very fortunate. Then again, uh, it seems like we are taking away less and less of those opportunities. And at one of my discussions earlier in Sydney, I did mention that the way the government um, is making these, these laws now, um, we are losing opportunities. The, uh, the newly appointed uh, governor of South Australia was a Vietnamese boat person. Mm -hmm. And in the last 20 years or 30 years, three of our young Australians of the years were both people and refugees. Mm -hmm. And now that we no longer allow any boat person to be resettled in Australia again, then we're losing opportunities. And you only have to look through the, uh, the results of those kids finishing high school to see how many Vietnamese names are on those lists of children who are doing so well, the children of the boat people yeah. who are going through, who still have that incredible, incredible work ethic. Once people are given a chance to live, uh, we all make the best of, for it for ourselves, but people who have refugee background like myself, not only we are determined to do better, but we do get back to a society that accepted us because uh, by nature we just, appreciate those who are helping you and give you a chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and because of the conditions that we've been in, we're just extremely resourceful to mm -hmm. survive. I used to say to people, I said, wouldn't you want to hire me after you knew that I survived with bare hands in the jungle? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'll be so resourceful. I will run your business for you. <laughs> you know? I want you to run the country. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, just, just one thing before we open it up to questions. Um, I often wonder, as we reach the end of our life, please God, it's a long time away for all of us. But what is it that you would like to say to other people? What is it about your collective wisdom that you would like to hand back as words to those who are left? Could be family, could be friends, could be to the world. What would you say? Well, find a way how you can help other people. It's going to make you happier. Mm. Um, I, I would say, especially to young people, to believe in themselves and know that we have that inner strength in us. So when atrocity strikes, do believe in yourself and you will survive. Mm. And, um, and I do believe that the, the, those who experience hardships um, are, are very com compassionate and, and will understand pain and be able to help others. Mm for both of you, it comes down to helping others, mm. doesn't it? Fantastic. Haven't they been extraordinary and amazing? Will you please thank Corina and Jan?